Yo, listen. Came to America, real youngster, learn from the OG's true gangsters. Mistakes I made never gave real answers. Then the problems came along, disaster. Had strapped for what came after. Saw my brother's ghost like Casper, piling through my mind like a tractor. What's the reason of life? All right. Here we are once again, built by Bailey's podcast. Welcome back, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Kwanzaa. Well, all the stuff that's happening this month. Uh, hopefully everybody is um, celebrating in any which fashion they choose as best they can. I'm glad to have us back on and get started for our holiday edition, we'll call it, of uh, Built by Bailey's podcast. So real quick, we just want to say Thank you so much for all the support from Confluence SBC, co-working office space in Lafayette, Colorado. As we continue to push forward to more normal life again, I know people, even if you are permanently going to be working from home, because many businesses have gone that direction, you still are going to want to go somewhere. You're going to need some, some office space, right? And you can do this by the week, the month, or the year at confluencesbc.com. Tom Hardy and the crew over there, uh, they definitely have space available. So just look them up and uh, give it a shot. It's a great space. I actually love to be there. That's where you used to do our podcasts. And um, they've got all kinds of conference rooms and offices you can actually lease out or just get a membership and take a desk. So it's a great spot. Also want to say thank you to Brian Scott, uh, 6ix9ine Design. He, of course, as you guys know, has done our logo, uh, the banner behind me. Um, getting ready this year to do some t-shirts and all the swag that we'll start pushing out. So I want to say thank you to Brian Scott and also wish him and his family um, the best. He's, uh, he's going through some rough stuff right now. So just want to say, hey, Brian, we're thinking about you and uh, thank you for all that you do. Super talented guy, 69design.com. You guys can get whatever you want from him. He is a graphic artist uh, extraordinaire. So um, yeah, thanks, that Brian. said, we are having our next guest for the holiday edition. James Childry, come on down. Come on down. You're the next contestant. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, James? Yeah. How are you? Good, man. It sounds like I'm ready to spin the wheel to win a prize. We have, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the prize <laughs> is Shane. <laughs> Surprise. Merry Christmas. Prize is Shane. Like, like oh, a wow. or something? We, we could have a <laughs> yeah. wheel. You guys watch Dude Perfect? You know what Dude Perfect is? Oh, yeah. You know oh, yeah. their wheel, unfortunate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't wheel mind. for our guests. <laughs> yes. Can win five minutes of your own platform where we don't interrupt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you get five minutes uninterrupted where the Bailey boys shut up. For five yeah. yeah. James Childry is a home inspector out in Montana. James Childry is also, uh, we'll call him, and I would call you an expert in energy for residential design. Is that fair? You have, oh, yeah. I don't know if I'd go expert, but I'm going to say expert because think about most people and I'm going to say builders too, that don't know a whole lot of anything when it comes to energy efficiency and design in homes. I think it's something that has slowly progressed. Um, maybe in the last 10 years where you're seeing production builders kind of being forced into some of this stuff that makes sense. But for the most part, I don't think there's many people out there that actually give a crap about it, one, but two, actually know even as much as you do. So you are an expert. So there you go. Well, you, you know, I, when I do, um, when, I, when, I, when I've been in situations where we're doing legal work, the definition in, in legal terms is just somebody who knows more than the average person is technically an expert. So there you go. <laughs> so you're certainly an expert. <laughs> yeah. So I, I get that. But by no means do I, I know as much as a lot of other guys, but um but yeah, you know, that's the thing. I, I've been a home inspector for going on 16 years now. Wow. So that, I didn't realize it was that long. Yeah. So 2005. Oh, old. No. Yeah. I used to have more hair. Um, <laughs> so did all of us. <laughs> so did all of us. <laughs> My lungs were still working at 100% capacity before that much time spent in insulation. Um, so, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's so that's been 16 years of um, looking at problems, right? Yeah. Just seeing where design issues are, where what materials last and what don't, how long things last. Um, and so I, I probably have become a bit jaded over that time. Um, so. It's unfortunate because there are, there are really good builders out there. There are all people who um, take the time and 
put in the effort to get the right design and materials. And um, I just so rarely look at their houses that I, I, I end up just seeing a lot of the junk. So um, I, I probably am jaded, but it has given me some sense of, of perspective on what's out there in the world. So That's interesting, <clears throat> the way you describe that. I find that fascinating. Um, how you are 16 years of looking at problems mm -hmm. because you never that's really think about that. <laughs> yeah. That's the job <laughs> of a home inspector, but I can't imagine now I'm thinking how many properties you and I walk through Shane, oh, we yeah. go through and we take a look at it and some of it, you just anticipate being, well, things are bad because they're old. Right. Right. Not necessarily that things are bad. I'm using super layman terms here, but because they were done wrong, because they're a problem. It's problematic construction, That's not right. necessarily just the stem wall is, you know, 50 years old or something. It is poorly constructed. Um, right. hmm, it's interesting. Yeah. And that's, yeah. and that's something that I would say is, um, <laughs> I remember, I, I can't take credit for the, for the joke, but, um, I was at a conference and a guy, he said, you know, when somebody's looking for a house, they go out with their realtor and that's kind of like them going out to the bar, right? And they go and they have a couple of drinks and they look at all these beautiful houses and they make this offer and they just, they're so in love with this person that they brought home and they spend all night just fantasizing about how wonderful it is. And then the home inspector is the one that turns on the lights in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and is that, a, that's a padded and, brawl. And sometimes you're like, oh, I, I still like what I brought home. But a lot of times you're like, oh, my God. What did I do? What did I do? And how do I get out of this? Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. That's exactly what that's like. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's weird. You should take your home inspector with you, not your realtor. Yeah, right. right, right. I mean, seriously, it should be your, this is my realtor, and that's my home inspector. Right. Why isn't the home inspector going out on? That should be like a whole nother thing where you just rent yourself out for the home buyer. See, that's another uh, revenue stream. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, rent me Seriously. out my power. So they have a, a position, well, a position. They have a, there's a, a piece of the industry that's, that has uh, construction consultants now. And that's been going on longer than I thought, because when I came up with some of that similar idea, I'm like, oh my God. And I presented that to my father-in-law and he goes, God bless you. That's, that's, that's been around for a long time, Shane. I, I know about it. I've used them before. And he brought this whole packet to me of what a construction consultant is. And they were used on job sites for basically for builders and for buyers to go when they're going to buy a home. You bring in a construction consultant and you pay them a little extra to kind of walk the project for you during construction and find those problems. You know, the problems that are going to be missed even by new home builders, right? Yeah. But it was the same sort totally. of deal. It's like, that's a, that's, a, that's a problem that exists today that someone really needs, but someone needs to be there and present. And I would, sh I would say people would want to pay extra to have someone walk through it at the beginning. Like, do I want to even put a contract in on this house? Mm -hmm. Why not just get through the, is this whole inspection period that we have with real estate. Why not just stop wasting everybody's time? <clears throat> Listen, I'll, in, I'll pay 300 bucks to have someone come walk it with me for an hour and say, here are all the things I see within an hour, right? right? Don't put an offer on this house, move on. Someone else may be like, I don't give two craps. Like Evan and I are investors. None of that makes a difference to us at all. So yeah, we're going to rip it out. We'll see where those gonna problems be are and rip it out. We'll take care of it, whatever we're going to do with the house. But as a you know, normal home buyer, it could it could solve it could solve problems as far as the duration of a contract because if you think about putting an offer in and waiting for so long to get to closing, a lot of that comes back to fighting back and forth about well, what about this? Well, you know, the inspector brought up these things. I want this and this, and they're, they're some of them are nominal or trivial. And James knows you've got to cover your ass when you do these, yeah. right? So you're putting everything into an inspection report. But what if you knew about all that stuff before you put the offer in, and then decided to put the offer in, knowing those things? And move past them quicker. I don't know. It could well, be. That, it's like sell for a pre-listing inspection, right? Right. Do it all up front. Disclose it. Fix it, or or adjust the price because of it. And I and I try to get listing agents to do that. The problem is nobody wants to pay for that. You know. That's the yeah. thing. 
It's money. Well, the home inspector is always like this dark, looming figure mm-hmm. working in the shadows that's just there to kill your dreams. Right. It's you know, it's dreams. like, right. yeah, yeah. It's just like, <laughs> I love it, please. Oh, it needs a new roof. Yeah. Oh, and it's like, well, yeah, that's good that we found out we need a new roof, right? <laughs> and the uh, listing agent's always scared, like, oh, God, now we got to go through inspection. Here come the uh-huh. home inspector's schedule come in, and you're just, just gr- you know, grimacing, like it's going yeah. to kill this deal, right? Yeah, no, totally. And it, that's not the point. No. Well, and, and as far as, you know, contractors go, I mean, you, you know, because you've had experiences with bad inspectors as well. I mean, we are generalists, right? I usually tell people right. I know a little bit about a lot of stuff and right. I usually know enough to say, I know that's not right, but I don't know how to fix it. I don't know what the, I don't necessarily even know what the right thing is, but I know that that's not the way it's supposed to be done. And you right. need to have a professional do that. And, and there are plenty of inspectors who either want to be the expert of the pro and everything or um or just talk out of their ass a lot i mean um i think maybe there's there's it's hard in our business because you can't it's hard to fake it till you make it because you're you're whatever you say is being taken as gospel you know people are going to act on that information and um and so i know i know contractors who they're just like james why do you guys always and i'm like hey hold on a sec I'm not every guy. Like I can only speak for myself. There are plenty of inspectors that suck. There are plenty of contractors that suck. Cause I could go back and say, why do you guys make my job so hard? Why don't you just do it right? And then I wouldn't have to have anything to write about. Right. Yeah. Totally. hundred percent. hundred percent. It's really strange to actually think about. I, it's like taking a mechanic to a used car dealership. Yeah. Right. Sure. It should happen. You should take your mechanic with you and be like, well, listen, it's uh, it's only a $15,000 Chevy. There's a clicking noise, but I'm sure. And then there's the salesperson just trying to say, ah, oh, that's just uh, it's the windshield it's a loose. Wiper. Yeah. It's a windshield wiper motor on the inside is making a clicker. And then your mechanic's like, I, I think that's your transmission, man. You know, <laughs> uh, I think you should make a different offer. That's hilarious. I, you know, home inspection is one of those things where I don't know, man, it's just, it's such a crucial part of a home buying, like the experience and process. And I just feel like it gets so little thought when people are considering what they're looking at. It's always like location, uh, bed location, bath location. combination. Yeah. And then it's like, and then we just, we're almost so emotionally attached to this half a million dollar home that we'll just look past, you know, what might be twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of really critical work that needs to happen to it to make it safe Mm -hmm. for the next you know and people just oh man it's almost like i just want to buy it and i don't want anyone to tell me there's anything it's almost like a diet like i just want to eat the cookies without knowing what goes bad with it and i'll just live with the consequences i just want to eat the cookies yeah right right it's like and then the home inspector comes in and says hey man you know, you can't eat those and then also complain about your weight, right? I just, ah, <laughs> oh, why are you always putting it in my face, man? And it's like, oh, dude, I'm just being honest with you. Yeah. You know, it's a, uh, it is a strange thing. I, and I, I feel like you guys are, I don't know, I guess it just depends, but it's, I guess the point I was getting at is even if you're the buyer, you would think the home inspector comes in, catches a bunch of things and you're like, yes. Like, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can get it for the seller having the home inspector come in and saying, listen, we got some serious problems here that need to be addressed, right? Because that might kill their deal or they they may not have the money to fix it or whatever, right? But even the buyer, sometimes I feel like just almost leave it off. I want to know, but I don't want to know kind of thing, you know? So it's a bit of a lonely job in that regard and that you don't... mm -hmm. You don't usually make a lot of friends with what we do. But, yeah, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, like... and, it is, and it is a matter of being objective is the most important part of that is just if I can stay away from subjective comments as far as like, I wouldn't do it that way, or it'd be better if it was this, or if it's just this thing is broken and that's it, then I can keep myself out of trouble and kind of walk that fine line. But, you yeah. know, what, what I always find interesting um, and again, I'm probably jaded after 16 years in the real estate industry, but I'm always surprised at how little real estate agents know about what they're selling. Yep. Right. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Is to sell yeah. a house. And when I say the, you know, the footing is cracked and they're like, where's the footing? Like they mm-hmm. think it must be near the ground because that's where their feet are or, right. you know, the, <laughs> whatever. But, you know, I say HVAC and they have to like break that down. And, and, and so there is some sense of, um, 
you know, frustration on my part because, you know, then, you know, there is some, the reason, part of the reason we have a job is because um, in our world where everybody is specialized in something, um, it means that we have less time or brain power to, to learn about everything. And so the, the longer I do this, the, the more I have clients who don't know much of anything about a home. And so our job becomes that much more important because we have to, not only am I expected to show them what the problems are, but also in some regard, educate them on how to right. operate their home, what their expectations should be for a house. And so, and it's simple things like, here's where you shut the water off. Here's where your water heater is. Here's where to change your filter in your furnace. And here's how often right. it needs to be done. I mean, very simple things, but people just kind of expect the house, it, you know, and we can, we can, you know, this, this could maybe even shift into like more of a home performance, but people expect that homes are static. Yep. They're, they're not dynamic things. They just, they just sit there and they just do their thing. And I live in them until I want to sell it. And then I make some money and I move on to the next house. And, and there's a real lack of um, understanding of um, how a home uh, needs to perform, what the maintenance requirements are. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, people are like this with cars too. Like they sort of nominally understand they need to change their oil and when their windshield washer fluid goes bad, they put it in or they goes, you know, it's gone, they put more in. But beyond that, it's, you know, in any mechanical table, well, hey man, you got to do these things at 50, 100,000 miles, whatever, if you want your, your car to keep running. And the house is the same way, you know, it's yep. walk into a 20 year old house and I say, hey, you need a new roof. And they're like, well, but it's only 20 years old. Like, Right, oh, right. Been in the sun and the weather for 20 years, man. It needs a new one. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a girlfriend. Well, let's say I knew a girl. She may or may not have been my girlfriend. We'll, we'll just leave it at that. Because that, of the way she defined it or you? Uh, <laughs> no, just, <laughs> okay, okay. okay. <laughs> she, uh, with, with her car, it was one of those things where it was very, it's a static, like it was, she was a very concrete thinker. Let's just put it that way. And, she didn't have any clue that she needed to be changing the oil three to six months, right? Uh, didn't have any clue that, you know, uh, eventually you're going to need new tires and uh, brake pads wear down. There was no maintenance on this car and it broke down. I don't know how many different times, but one time in particular, we're driving up over a pass and it overheated and to the point where the car just shut down. Like that was it. It literally destroyed the engine it was ripped it apart so we coast over to the shoulder steam's going everywhere and she's about to open the hood I'm like no 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 don't do that you're gonna burn your face off you know we're gonna so i i we're sitting there waiting for it to cool down so i can pop the hood and i'm kind of asking her when's the last time you did you know you changed your oil and she's like and I had this look and i said you do change your oil why where's the oil we have a problem and we got to the everywhere. Point where, like, <laughs> no coolant in the vehicle. Oh, yeah. No oil. So she'd been driving this thing, literally the engine dry for God knows how long. I don't know how the car even was functioning at this point because it was several years in that she's owned this, right? And it's funny because to me, that whole situation is there's maintenance that's required for anything. Our bodies require maintenance as we get older, things start to fall apart. You got to stay healthy in order to keep those things working. It's the same thing. And you're right, James, it's the same thing with a house, not only just homeowners, but realtors with a very little understanding of the fact that when you're buying even a brand new home, at some point you have to do these things to a home. To, there's upkeep and nobody, nobody wants to do it. And nobody knows how to do it. And I think going back to the whole home inspection that people get and the report that comes with it at the end, a lot of that to me, in my opinion was this report is for your education as you purchase this asset in order to keep it working for you and to make money for you down the road, this is your little Bible, right? This is what you need. So you got to not only use this as like maybe some, a little bit of negotiating power and things that may be an issue, but also use this down the road. This may not be a problem now, or it may not need any maintenance now, but it's going to need it. These are things that are operational and they're dynamic and they, and they will wear down over time. And, I think there's a better education needs to happen because of that. But I think home inspector's job, I think part of that is, is you're right, educating those people, including the realtor. But Well, you know, it's funny, though. It's like it's just the, it, using the car analogy is a good one. But there is a, a stark difference here. A, a car is a depreciating asset. Correct. 
right? So you really have to take care of it because you don't have the option of just getting rid of it and right. saying, well, this one's starting to break down. So I'm just going to get a new one that's not broke and let someone else fix this and resell it. it just doesn't work that way. But in the home ownership, you can at a certain level get away with some not maintenance because it's an appreciating asset. You can just say, well, maybe it needs a new roof, but I bought this for 250000 10 go and now it's 375,000. So I'll just sell it. I'll put it on the market, sell it. And I actually get to make money and let the roof be someone else's problem or take a concession. I don't care. Right. Right. You know, so there's this idea you can always sell or upgrade and get rid of and pass that on to someone else because you've made money on the property. Um, there's in theory, also in theory. in theory, in theory, I mean, that's because those repairs have to happen gen, at some point. Generally, the idea, but yeah. yeah, no, they'll have to happen at some point. But if you bought a house for 250 and you've had it for 10 years, it's a new roof. And now, let's say, like here in Colorado, and now it's 399 or something, mm -hmm. 400,000. You're just like, fuck it, you know, we'll just have the home inspector come in and say it needs a new roof, and we'll just say, hey, take 20 grand off, you know, because um, I've made so much money on it, I didn't really care. And I knew I was only going to stay here for 10 years. We're upgrading. So mm -hmm. there's a, almost like a built-in excuse sometimes to let something go if you're in that kind of equitable position. Correct. Yeah. Like, I don't necessarily need to spend money. I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make money on this. The other thing, too, is there is a difference between kind of like your annual maintenance to a house and then your actual long-term maintenance roofs and gutters and things like this. Um, you know, there's a difference between changing your air filter in your furnace and, you know, replacing your roof um, or having it reshingled or getting new windows or whatever it might be. Um, the daily maintenance stuff. And James, you could probably talk it. This has just been my experience when Shane and I look at houses, I buy houses, et cetera. It is like usually the biggest problems you have in a house come from the simplest things. Think grading, right? Having good grading at your house, like making sure there's the, your, your actual lot is sloping away a little bit from your foundation or drainage, like having the right amount of dirt around your house could save you tens of thousands of dollars in uh, foundation issues, um, gutters, routing water away. You know, these things are so inexpensive, but cause the biggest problems. Yep. Um, and James, in your experience, does that seem, I mean, outside of poor construction and the idea of maintenance and taking care of the house, can you talk about that a little bit? Like where you see some of the biggest problems and uh, pointing at some of the easiest ways to avoid them? Well, yeah. So um, you're right. There's so there's there's two points I kind of want to take away from that. One is um, the things that usually cause the biggest problems are the most boring for the yes, homeowner. Yes. That's right? a good way to put it. Yes. yes. Right. Like, I'm like, hey, if all your gutters terminate next to your foundation. You know, the dirt goes this way, so all the water saturates the soil, and hydrostatic pressure pushes water vapor into your house and gets trapped in a wall and causes mold. And they're like, okay more dirt get it you know and then yeah. and they move on right um and i'm like hey you know your your ducting is improperly sized or partially disconnected and not sealed and therefore these rooms aren't going to be warm like ah, oh, we'll put a heater in there it's fine we'll right. just turn up the heat more you know um so you know you don't have enough insulation up there they're like oh well whatever it's warm and i'll put on a sweater you know it, it doesn't garner the same emotional reaction as when they walk in and they're like oh my god i I hate this stove and these cabinets need to go. And yep. you're like, you are focusing on the wrong things, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the other part of it is the, I, I, I say this a lot to people like, do this for a few hundred dollars so it doesn't turn into a few thousand dollars later. Mm -hmm. um, because that's also something where the, the simple things, like you said, the inexpensive things of putting on gutter downspouts, of changing your filters, of, um, you know, draining your water heater once a year can prolong its life. The simple things like that can save you a lot of money and, and don't let that. Making a note of draining the water heater. 
<laughs> Shame on you. He doesn't listen to me. So I'm glad you're actually here. He's definitely going to take some notes. <laughs> I just literally wrote down change water heater or drain Everyone water heater. Go figure that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah so- I talked about earlier. Change your oil in your car. You better go drain your water heater. I've never, I know it's been I've never done that. <laughs> Once a year, you just run it till the water runs clear. You get all the sediment out of there. It helps. Yep. Um, you know. It totally makes sense. Yep. Uh, so yeah, there's there are there are a lot of things like that, and the two things that I get most frustrated with are are just that that lack of maintenance and upkeep, mm-hmm. and um, and you know it's interesting because every inspector comes from a certain we ha- we all have a biased perspective in some manner. I would say sure. that. 90% of, of inspectors are used to be contractors, saw inspecting as being the easier thing to do, right? I don't have to carry a bunch of crap around. I don't have to deal with subs. It's just me. And I go out and I do my thing. And and they're all probably more technically, you know, proficient than I am. I mean, they, I've never actually built a house before, right? And I, and I have to sort of, I actually overcome that with some of my clients. And the way I come, I get over that is I say, I'm trained as an inspector. This is my job. I don't, I don't come at it with a bias of how I would have built the house. I just say right and wrong. This is how things go. Um, that's how my mind works. And so I come in with a bias of, um, of home performance. How does everything work to, as a whole system, right? Because one thing does influence another. And so most guys will come in with, you know, having been a roofer or a framer or a, a general or whatever. And, um, they usually have some sort of bias and, and in a lot of respects, I think that handicaps them in a lot of ways, even though they might know more than I do. Um, Absolutely. And so for me, I can say, well, um, you know, this room is cold because, you know, the ducting is undersized and you don't have any return air. And by the way, that, that window is fogging because you don't have enough ventilation in your bathroom and, you know, it's, it's cold in here because there's no insulation up there and we can kind of put all those pieces together. So try to match the experience of the homeowner with um, what's actually going on. And it's usually not one thing, you know, we in Montana and I'm sure in Colorado too, you guys get a lot of um, ice damming issues. Yep. And so everybody just puts heat strips up. Right. There's ice up here, I'm going to melt it. Right. Heat tape. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And sometimes that is the only option, but 90% of the time it's a more, um, it's this more systemic problem, right? It's, Mm -hmm. it's heat loss and it's, um, and it's causing problems that are hidden to them. So until the water starts running down the wall, they just think it's a pretty icicle that they should, you know, take a picture of. It's normal winter and that's what happens, icicles and until it actually starts causing damage to their structure. I'm I'm growing the perfect uh, murder weapon. (laughs) come pick out your murder weapon because it's the perfect one um i feel like this is probably a good transition but uh going into the like efficiency part um of yeah i want to talk about that for sure but i yeah yeah you actually give us a little background of how the hell did you get into home inspection i mean like from from where you were in college and what you majored in what how did you fall into this home inspecting world? And then it transitions into where I think I would say part of your passion is, 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 is efficiency and energy and energy design for sure of homes. Yeah. So um, the short version of a longer story is I went to school as a banker, a degree in international finance, worked for some banks, realized that was a soul sucking career that was going <laughs> to end me in divorce and a cocaine <laughs> habit probably. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was I was saved from that by the fact that um, uh, my father-in-law actually had a home inspection business that he was retiring out of and selling. Um, it meant that I had to move to Florida, but we're like three to five years, then we'll be out of here. We'll be back out west. Uh, and then so I went down there. I bought the business, knew absolutely nothing. I didn't know what a fascia board was. I didn't know what OSB stood for. I didn't know anything. Right. Uh, I mentored with him for a year, learned enough to purchase the business, um, purchased the business within a year, the entire market exploded. And then, you know, I was left with this business that I paid this much for that was now worth absolutely nothing. And so that three to five year plan turned into 10 years, but, um, but we, we built it back up and, you know, I, I, interesting to have lived in a hot, humid climate with hurricane risk, selling that business and then moving to Montana. And it was, I had actually no intention of going back into home inspection. I was going to do something else. Um, right. Didn't end up working out. But um, but then I, I got a bit reinvigorated here because it was completely different. All of a sudden, I had to learn 
you know, about chimneys and ice damming and mm -hmm. heating systems. And so I kind of got a, a um, re-energized. And part of that was um, getting into the home performance part of the world uh, of, of building. And that's where I felt like, you know, I think everybody, I'm not a millennial by any means, I'm, I'm way past that, but I think everybody wants to change the world in some way. They want to have some impact. And mm -hmm. I felt like when I look at the numbers and you say that, you know, 40% of energy consumption is in the buildings and that they're, and the more I learned about it, the more I realized how inefficiently we're building them and how poorly designed they are and how easy the improvements are to right. actually have a real impact on, on climate change, on um, energy consumption. And, and they didn't have to be, it wasn't this thing where you had to change the whole world. You just kind of could change one house at a time. And, right. and so through that, I think I found something that was a little bit more, um, it seemed like more impactful than just doing a home inspection. And it was sort of transactional and here are the things you're wrong with your house, give me your money and I'll move on to the next guy. And that's sort of, that's what wore me out. But you know, it's interesting to think about like what a home is. It's this form and function, right? That it's uh, it's shelter, it's safety, it's it's allows us to live in places we normally would not be able to live in. You know, go down the line, and if you think just even like historically, what a house is from people sleeping outside to all of a sudden creating rudimentary structures to be able to protect themselves and keep their things and. And somewhere, uh, maybe with the HGTV boom or whatever it might be, where it's like the form of the house takes precedent over the function almost at a certain point. When you think about what you're buying or what you're wanting to build, it's reflection of you. It's the space. It's how you feel inside the space. And it's almost secondary saying, well, hold on a sec. Let's not forget what this is. This is a place for me to be safe inside and to be comfortable and uh and it's weird because it feels like when you think about it, that should be number one right number one how does the home function for me does it keep me warm does it keep me dry does it keep me out of the elements and then does it keep me safe um and it's such an expensive thing it's one of you know if not i i think shane and i I can't remember what the number is, Shane, but it's, it's just like for most people, the, the house is the most expensive thing they ever purchase, right. you know, in their life. And it's like, but I just want it to look pretty. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> but you live in it, man. Um, and you think about the two extremes where you were at, whether it was Florida or Montana, which I'm trying to figure out, was that just like a knee jerk reaction? Like, fuck this humidity. Where is a cold place? Like Montana. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that Montana has a reason. It just but don't tell me because I find it fun to think that he's a big skier. Oh, okay. And a big mountain biker. Okay. There we go. Um, or <laughs> just to me, don't think about I still that like the idea of Florida. like, I'm fucking out of here. Where are you going, yeah. James? Montana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, like, dude, there's probably somewhere in between. Nope. Um, <laughs> But it is, uh, I think, interesting uh, because I even get caught in that, caught up in that sometimes. I'm the design guy. I'm the make it look pretty. And but I want it to function really well still too. But I think of function not really as much as the house, as how a space functions. And there's there's a stark difference between those two. Oh sure. You know, I want like an open concept. I want to be able to have the space function for me. It's like, what about the home though? Mm -hmm. Well, this is um, no the actual brick and mortar windows. What you're spending on it every single month and utilities, um, the money I that you keep that, putting into it. I think that the the expectation or the assumption uh, from any homeowner is that that's already taken care of. Right. Right. You follow right. code. There's a path. You just you build the wall. And like, what more is there to know about a wall? Yep. You insulation in the attic what more is there to know right like what well, everybody just assumes that that shell is it just is what it is right mm -hmm. and that the heating system i turn on the thermostat and hot air blows out and what else is there to know but which countertop like there's a million choices and there's you know what i mean so i just think that there's this this assumption that that it just is and there isn't any other way to do it um, and if you I, want to know how important a wall is go out 
live out in the woods in Montana and build yourself a cabin. Uh-huh. Right. And then tell <laughs> me how important, important that thing. wall is. <laughs> yes. In the backs of the lines. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Go out there and try to do that. And you won't give a shit about the inside. You just <laughs> want that wall to be warm. That's right. It. And like keep it. all the air out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it's yeah. the same idea, though. Yeah. I think you're right, though. They just think, well, there's builders, there's home inspectors now. So it must already be good. There's international code. There's all these things. And if the wall is then at some point the wall was fine. So therefore it must still be fine. And I want to talk about what paint color I want to put on the wall now. Right. Well, you know? and that, that and, and if we go along that line of assumptions, we say most people also feel like, well, it passed city inspection. It must be good. Right. Most people see a code compliant house as an A rating, not right. a D rating, which is what it is. Right. It didn't fail. Minus. Not yeah. it is high performance. Minus. It's it won't fall down or burn down. Minimum code. Minimum. Code. Minimum. Yeah. Right. It doesn't mean it Just can't be substantially better. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, and, yeah. and so part of my business, the part that I'm building up more and more is, um, you know, which started with energy code compliance. So I do blower door testing and duct tightness testing. And those are things that at least here we, we did. I, I timed it well, not by, by luck, not skill, but um, we just happened to implement um uh, the newer energy code in 2016, which required testing. So I happen to have all the equipment. I'm HERS Raider certified, so I could go out and do these tests for contractors. So, um, and then we started testing them and they were all performing very, very poorly. They were, code, yeah. you know, but the, when it's a, a prescriptive path where it says build a tight house and they say, check tight house, they think they're doing it right. And then you test it and you're like, actually, you're not because you missed all of these details. Um, that it was an eye opener for the contractors. I think that as, as much as I begrudge contractors, I think that a lot of it does just come from, um, it's not the right word, but ignorance, right? They just don't know any better. They, yeah. They, I've no, been doing it wasn't that they were they're trying here, to boy. build a yeah. house. They just, they're just doing what they know how to do. And so when we started actually testing it, we'd say you actually have to seal that that sill plate. You actually have to make sure that all of your wall penetrations are sealed. Otherwise, air is flowing through there. And with air is the heat and the moisture and the bugs and everything else. And so um, it did become an educational process. And I think that that's, that's where I, I, I try to find hope. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't think it's going to come from self-education. I'm, I'm over the idea that if we just put enough information out there, that everybody's going to, to read it and understand it and um, the world's gonna be a better place. I mean, unfortunately, I, I felt like if, if it's not gonna be required, if it's not gonna be in the code, there's a good chance it's not gonna happen. Right, and that and you know what, it's, so we're, we're rapidly, as you guys are aware, rapidly approaching 2021, which is, you know, a, a week away. And Something, when I was it's a like kid- a, It's like a flag on a golf hole, just gives yeah. you hope. I can <laughs> see it. I can so, see it. Just gives so many. So, in theory, it's a yeah. great. It's a great. Yeah, it's a great look ahead. Yeah. I think this year more than many, obviously. Um, but when I was a kid, that that you see that date in a movie, and it's like there's flying cars, and there's you know laser guns, and there's all this stuff. But we're we're literally here, which um, as I've seen, especially in the last, I would say, ten years of the building industry. And the types of things that have been forced to change on the code side and the energy co- side. So like the international energy code compliance division, that's literally being shoved down our throats right now. And you're, you know, you're seeing that cause you're going out and you have to, you're checking for these things. Mm-hmm. We're talking about plate penetrations and, and our values for walls and, and attics have gone drastically gone up and, and the way you have to now achieve that. But the, the part that's funny is, as more information comes out on and these guys are being forced and i say guys these builders and and general contractors are being forced into some realm of complying with these newer energy codes because you, you can't even do an addition in most places even here without going through either some sort of prescriptive path um or you're you're gonna i'm calling you to go to a blower test now and then once we finish our our construction we have to be able to achieve greater numbers than we had at with the house as is before construction started. So a lot of that's more of a pain in the ass, but it's, it's forcing builders and contractors to learn these things because you have to, in order to be able to move forward with the, with the project. Um, 
And what's starting to come of that is with all of the technology now that we're in 2021 with lumber, with insulation, with, you know, heating, you know, and HVAC systems in general and the things we can do, the cost of a lot of this construction is actually coming down and becoming more efficient just to build it. For instance, wall assemblies that I'm kind of geeking out about these days, especially as we get into shipping container construction, but how to, how to build a header with, with an LVL, but not even an LVL, but like a rim board. And so now I can pack insulation into the header with an inch and an eighth piece of engineered lumber. And these guys, and I say the guys that are older that are not, you know, they're maybe closer to retirement now because I'm getting old. They're not understanding how you can do that, but it's engineered lumber. It's the same rim board you're using to pull all of your joists together, but now you can use that in a header. So the framers, once they learn how to do it, they're faster than they were before. You're getting, you're hitting your R values and your energy compliance easier. So there's less headache. You're not battling someone like James to try and get your numbers up. And all of a sudden these guys are going, well, this isn't so bad. Wait, why wasn't I doing this before? You didn't have the information. Some of it was technology. Sure. But most of it, you could be doing a lot of that before even some of this technology. And now that it's, I'm starting to see on the, the, the older generation, the guys that are like in their fifties and sixties, even that are starting to understand this is better. And it's better because it's just like my dad fighting my dad with, um, you know, electric cars and, why did why do you need to fight this whole climate stuff? It's not about the climate for you. Would you rather plug your car in at night and never pay for gas and oil changes again? It's just less expensive. Just think about it in that respect for you. It's easier, less expensive, which means you make more money. No. Did he no. freeze up? He did. It's a good dude, good luck though. <laughs> He'll edit this out with some music. <laughs> um, well, I, I, we'll about continue. About, yeah. Oh, there we go. You froze okay. up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I just, yeah, I see, I see this year, hopefully in many respects is the year where, um, I think more, more of that becomes I, more conventional and it just becomes easier. Yeah, so I, I, I hope so. I, unfortunately, yeah. um, I sat in on all the, the code adoption committees, uh, for the state of Montana and, just beg desperately to just just adopt the code as written for twenty the twenty eight. So we're in we're going into twenty twenty one. We're arguing over the twenty eighteen code because right. we're Montana and we like to be behind as much as possible. Everyone and, does that, just so you know. Oh They're no, I know. One book I know. behind. Yeah. And um, but so they've watered it all down, and yeah. they did it last year, last time, go round. Uh, we we're on the twenty twelve code cycle, and um, their excuse then was. Um, well, it's, we need to give the, this is the first time we've ever had an energy code. We need to give the contractors an opportunity to learn how to do this stuff. And we're like, okay, fine, cool. Four ACH instead of three duct testing is minimal. We're not going to do exterior insulation. We're not going to do all the things that are required for this climate zone. Fine. And then 2018 comes along. Okay. They all learned. Now, can we do the, the cool stuff? Can we advance this? Can we push it forward? Can we progress it? And they're like, um, no. No, it costs too much money. I was going to say, what, why do you think they say no? So they say no because uh, they, they put it under the guise of affordability, right? So okay. like most places, um, you know, Bozeman in particular is, is a very I expensive place to live, right? There, there's a lack of affordable housing. And so, you know, the, the Builders Association comes along and says for every, you know, 0.1 ACH that you make us, you know, improve the the house by it, it increases the cost by $800 or something. So they had this number, they said, well, if you go from four ACH to three ACH 50, that means it's going to cost us, you know, $2,200 more per house to build. And for every thousand dollars, more expensive a house is, it cuts out, um, you know, th 13,000 people from being able to purchase a house nationwide. Like their right. NHB has put together all these numbers that say that that statistically show um, home ownership becomes less attainable the more a house costs, and of course that's true. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's that finite. I think people purchase homes in broader ranges than a thousand dollars here and there, right. um, and I also think that I don't know, man. I mean, when I moved here. The median home price was 385, and right now it's 615. 
Yeah. Jesus. Five years. Are you, you win, Bozeman? Yeah. Okay. My God. So yeah. five years, the price has gone up by that much. And you know what? Like, there's still a thousand people a month moving here. Like, people right. are still living here. They're still working here. So while I think statistically it certainly is true that, that it's expensive and, like, for us – we're having a hard time buying a house because we're, we keep getting priced out. There's a lot of competition in the lower end of the market. So it's not to say that those things aren't true, but I don't think that that is the full picture for me. Mm -hmm. It's the builders association way to cop out of doing the right thing. You know, well, okay. I'm going to lob this out to both of you guys, right? Whose responsibility is, is it for, progressing the efficiency of residential housing is it the homeowner is it the builder is it your municipality is it the can the government subsidize that would that be a better use of taxes when we subsidize farmers because we see that there is a bigger greater benefit to the overall good if you can make because farming by itself without subsidies isn't always very profitable and if it's not profitable you're going to lose your farmers and if you lose your farmers, you lose your food. So we say, okay, well, hold on. We got to come in. We got to step in. We got to do something. So I can see playing devil's advocate or being an, or when you, when you already have an issue of rising house prices, and then you come in and say, let's force a change on construction, renovation that makes it more expensive. Even if there could be arguments saying, well, we save money by doing it, but still the upfront costs helping people get in. It's just like early days solar panels, right? It's right. 20,000 bucks, but you're going to save that money over 15 years. Yeah, but it's 20 grand now that I don't have. Right. Right. So, and it's kind of like, okay, so if we make it more expensive, even if it's the right thing to do and having a home function better and be more energy efficient is the right thing to do. And it's where it needs to get. It's kind of saying, where is the clog? Where's the bottleneck? Is it that if we raise prices, it prices people out? But do we make the argument that it saves you money over time and then help cover the cost up front? Who's covering the cost? Or do we just make it more expensive and put it on the builder to figure out how to still deliver the product relative to what it costs prior, but upgrade it? So with kind of that framework, how do we get these homes to turn the corner where efficiency, energy consumption, all those things kind of get bumped up the list of importance almost more so than, you know, aesthetics of a house or, you know, talk about that. What do you guys think about that? Whose responsibility is it really? And or who should take the responsibility in making sure that gets through? Because I'm sure a homeowner would say, I would love to have that my house be more efficient, but not at the cost of my new bathroom that right. I want, right? Or, and the builder is going to say, well, I understand that you want me to do like what you were describing, Shane. It sounds complicated, but how much is that? Does that mean that we're going to go 15, 20 grand over budget? Because I, I want the house to get completed, right? right? And I don't want to have to go borrow more money somewhere to do it. And, or should it be, the government or your local municipalities forcing that and then subsidizing on the back end. How do we get there? Well, I mean, I could get on, um, I could get on a soapbox for a long time about this. I'm going to try not to. Uh, <laughs> this is the format for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, it, it, it's been, it's been top of mind for me for the last several years because I have experienced it personally in renting and not being able to purchase either because, you know, we didn't qualify or there just wasn't enough housing stock on the market. And, um, and then professionally um, watching as prices increase and contractors make more money and people are getting priced out, but there's more money equity coming in from other markets. So it kind of continued to spur this thing. And um, so there's been lots and lots of talk about affordability. And I, I've kind of come down to the point where, you know, and it sounds, I don't know, it sounds, I don't know, crass is the right word, but like, the idea in, in America that everybody should own a house, I think is just flawed. You know, if you look at a lot of places around the world, you know, look at like Europe, for instance, I mean, owning a home is, I mean, you, you are in the top echelon of, of, you know, your upper middle class or, you, you know, you, you have more money and, and you're, you're not buying 
sprawling estates. And, you know, not, not everybody has a three, two with a white picket fence and a quarter acre. And, and, you know, and that's the dream that we sell everybody. And then um, as, as a community, as a culture, as a government where, you, you know, everybody feels let down because they can't get that. And, and I just, I feel like that's the wrong framework. I think that, you know, owning a townhouse, owning a condo, you know, is, is also owning a home and um, being able to be part of that. But um, in America, we want land. We, you know, remember the homesteaders and we think that we should be able to have that and that we should be able to have that when I, when you make 15 bucks an hour. Right. Right. And that if I can't have that, it's something's wrong with the market, with the contractors, with the government, it's something else. But I just, I, I, I think that that's, it's not sustainable, right? Because when it comes down to affordability, there's only a few things you can change. People can make more money. You can make houses less expensive or the government can subsidize it in some way because, right. and, and there are limiting factors on all of that stuff. You know, Bozeman has run into that a lot. And I just come to the point where I'm like, well, maybe not everybody deserves to own a home in Bozeman, right? Like there is some limit to, if you want to live in this place, if you want to live in Boulder, if you want to live in Fort Collins, if you want to live in downtown Denver, like it just is expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. you choose to live there, then you choose to live there knowing that either you're going to afford less, you're going to spend more on your house. And, and so from that perspective, I, I think I, I have an opportunity to kind of step back and say, I think that there is a an economy of scale to be gained from forcing contractors in the front end to figure it out. And once they do, they realize it doesn't cost you 2000 extra dollars to go from a four ACH to a three. It costs you $0. Mm -hmm. You just have to do it right. Right. It right. doesn't cost more money to do, you know, a rim joist as a header because you're, you've got one piece of engineered lumber instead of two, two by sixes or whatever. Right. I mean, there, there is economy that can come from that. I mean, even a passive house, which is, the really far end of a performance spectrum, right? We're talking about an R100 wall, right? You're like, mm. holy crap, nobody's going to do that, right? But the guys who know how to do it, there's a 5 to 10% premium for a house that performs 100 times better than a standard house. So it's not as if it really has to be expensive. And so I don't feel like it's a burden, um, except that it's requiring contractors to learn new skills. It's requiring municipalities to enforce the things that they're asking to be done. And it's an education on the homeowner's part to demand better. I mean, right. I think that's So the could you then say, maybe it is the code, because if the code changes, that would force the builder to have to adapt. And yeah. if they did it, if they were forced to adapt, then they would learn an alternative way that doesn't necessarily cost more money. But I feel like if you leave the code, you know, where it's at, where you're saying this is minimum code, go back to that, right? Um, then that's what they're going to do. Yeah. Right. This is all you forced me to do, so I'm going to do this. Anything above that is me just like taking my own liberty to be better. But you guys, you guys, whoever those people are, right, have already told me what's okay. So I'm going to do okay unless the homeowner asks me to do more than okay. Right. And right. So maybe if it's really the builder that says, hey, listen, we need to get better at this and we need to learn how to do it in a way that's not so much more expensive. Well, then maybe actually then it does need to be the code because I think people will just generally operate at minimum, right? right. Well, and, the, and the homeowner gets a house without having to manage. I mean, I'm just, I'm out of... I've, I've lost faith in the idea that the market will demand better, not in a timeline yeah. that is, um, that is going to help. I mean, if you, if you really step back from a, a, that climate change perspective and that buildings really can have an impact on that, both mm -hmm. individually from just an energy consumption point of view, but also a sustainability point of view. I mean, you think about the embodied energy of a structure and it's insane, right? Yeah. And so... Um, all of that needs to be rethought in a better way. And there are lots of people who are doing that. And that, that's the part that really frustrates me um, is that there, we don't have to wait for the new whiz bang thing, right? It, it's not like right. we're waiting for technology. We're just waiting for people to actually implement the processes and technology and, and materials that already exist to build something better that doesn't have to cost more. 
And you know what's talking about energy? Sorry, Shane, I'll just want to throw one more little thought in here. You know, Shane and I have talked about this with money, right? With investing. I think there's something to be said too, where there is a parallel when you think about energy, getting energy and spending energy, right? And, you know, we've, Shane and I have talked about before that there's two ways to make money, right? You can go out and physically make more money, or you can figure out where you're saving money. Either way, it's a net gain, mm-hmm. right? So if I'm only making $3,000 a month and, and it leaves me with about $500 in my checking account every single week, then I need to make more money. Well, let's take a look to see if there's $500 you can save. And now you've got a thousand. It's almost like you've given yourself right. a, a, you a, know, raise. A, a raise, you know, in that regard. And I think a lot of people, when they think about energy, you know, and certainly if you just lobbed out to the, to the lame and, you know, I have a really um, energy efficient house. I think that tells people that it doesn't spend a lot of energy, but I think people, when they think about having a really um, taking energy into consideration and construction, I feel like people think you mean a windmill in my backyard. You mean me down on a bicycle, like giving myself power. And it's like, no, 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 it's, there is spending energy, right? But if you're barely using any, it's kind of the idea of like, you don't need to give yourself a raise. You don't need to necessarily go harvest more solar energy for your house as much as you might think about where you're spending the energy, how much you're wasting, right? right? You know, so if you're spending $1,000 worth of energy and you're like, well, let me get solar panels and I'll get all that energy back. And it's like, well, you may not need to make that investment. You, I'd rather you look at how you're spending a thousand dollars in energy instead of getting more in. And I think for just the people listening to this podcast now that aren't necessarily in the industry that are homeowners or about to be homeowners or whatever, right? Or have been homeowners for a long time. You know, I still sometimes even get caught in the trap. Like I want solar panels. I have a perfect house for it. Um, I get baked with the Southwest sun every single day in the back. My roof slopes that way. I got no trees interfering. I'm elevated up in the hill. I, man, I can't wait to get solar panels. Yet my bedroom is an ice box, (laughs) you know? And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm the quintessential now. I'm kind of in a live in flip, um, so I know I need to address that. I've been up in the crawl space. My like, God, I need more insulation. Why is this <coughs> room so cold? <coughs> Excuse me. I go down into the guest bedroom. I can literally put my hands like down below the baseboard and I can feel air coming in. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, maybe before solar panels, I should stop <laughs> that, whatever that is, because I have to just run the heat all the time. Right. And so my thought process is, well, if I'm going to run this amount of heat, let's get some solar. Right. So I can just keep wasting free energy. Right. Instead of thinking about stopping the bleeding of same thing with like money, you're just hemorrhaging cash and you're trying to figure out how to make more money. Why don't you stop the hemorrhaging and you find out you probably don't need that. You don't need to be on your bicycle down there, like cranking, you know, your energy up, you know, like a gerbil. Um, I just think there's a distinction there. And I think people get that confused. Oh, I really want an energy efficient house. So I'm going to get solar. I'm going to get some wind. I'm going to, I'm going to do It's like, dude, think about where you're wasting energy. And you might find out you don't need to make that amount of investment into your home as much as you think you do. Right. Um, you know, well, and I just you could probably speak to from a contractor's perspective, as far as doing the right thing versus doing the thing that makes you money. Well, and that's, that's, and I think it's all comes down to, it's just an education and it's, 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 you're right, James, it's ignorance. And the ignorance isn't like, we see that as like that connotation of word is as a bad word. Like you're ignorant. Well, what it means is you're just not privy to information that may others may have. And it doesn't mean you're stupid and can't figure this out or can't learn how to do this. It just means you haven't either. And I'm, I'm a proponent of trying to learn, you know, teach myself. I never was a big school guy, but I always, always wanted to learn, but going back to sharing that information, like we've been trying to do, this is kind of what I've progressed with the, with the whole social stuff, especially with this podcast is, is getting that information out there because a lot of it is not that hard to learn, especially if you're somebody that's been in the industry, but it's also really easy to get that information and it costs less money or the same amount 
as it would have already cost you to build the same home. For instance, ceiling plates and, and the way that you can, you know, frame your corners and your walls, there's actually less effort to be made in some of this than you would have done otherwise. And if you're in there, like, it's funny because one of the YouTube videos that I did was on fire blocking and draft stopping. And it was for a base, it's for basement projects out here in Colorado, the way we have to frame our basements with floated walls and how we have to put the whole deal, you know, with, especially with, as energy codes have changed. And there were so many questions I got from actual contractors saying, thank you so much for giving this information. It's great. I never thought about that. I'm out there just doing what I'm, you know, the, the filling penetrations and plates that I needed to do, but I walked right past all the other stuff. And it's like, just so I can get a, 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 you know, the inspector to sign off. Why wasn't I just doing that? 10 more seconds. I end up throwing half the can of the last, you know, can of fire block away. So I've already spent the money on the fire block. Like this guy literally told me this. And I'm like, yep. He's like, but I'll have like, you know, if I need three for a thousand square foot base, I'll go through two and a half to two and three quarters cans. And then I'd throw away the rest because I can't reuse it. It's not like I can seal that can up. It's going to, once it's open and it's, the chemical reactions happened, it's going to harden it eventually. And he's like, I don't know why I just don't seal all of them because it's the same. It's a better material than what I've used anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I'm not thinking about the inspector so much as I'm just thinking about, well, I've already paid the money. I'm like, exactly. It's exactly right. You know, all James, these things are the same. You bring up a good point about the money part of it, because if uh, you said earlier, what was the five to 10% premium for, it was like an R100. It was like a passive solar house. What, what like a, pa that? a passive house. A passive house. So to describe what a passive house is. What's so, the premium there? Well, so when you, I, I guess I'll, I'll take a step back. And, and when I talk to people about home performance, they think I'm nutty to begin with. Like, what do you mean a home performs, right? Well, it is supposed to operate in a certain way. It's supposed to keep the heat in and the cold out or vice versa. Um, it, like you said, it's supposed to provide shelter and comfort. And um, and so there are, there are homes that are in that, that code minimum that are that degrade. And as you progress to something that is better um, from a performance point of view, it usually has to do with how much energy is consumed in order to get the highest performance out of that house. And so, um, whereas a co-compliant house has a minimum amount of uh, insulation, higher performing houses generally have more insulation and they're in different places and different types, right? And so um, you go from like standard built house to say Energy Star. Energy Star is 15% better than co-compliant. So better, and it's a brand that a lot of people know and understand. They see the sticker on their appliances. Um, you can also get that sticker for your house. It says, yeah, this house meets certain minimum standard, performance standards that are better than code. And then you go from Energy Star to, you know, people are familiar with LEED, for instance, you know, and there's LEED has silver, gold, platinum. Um, how efficient is this? And, and there are obviously problems with all of these systems. But um, th so there are a lot of these standards um, that we use to determine, um, you know, to provide <laughs> the sticker you can put on your house that says my house meets these standards, right? And so passive house is sort of the extreme of that where it, it, it comes out of Germany and the, the, the really basic idea is like, you should be able to heat your house with a dog and a candle. Right? Like the heat from the dog and the candle will heat the entire house. That's how efficient, that's how good it is at, at maintaining the, the energy load in the house, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they also use um, how many hair dryers worth of energy would it take to heat this house? And like a passive house that's say, you know, 1500 square feet, 15 blow dryers could worth of energy could run the entire house. So they've tried to like make these sort of these things that you, the average person could understand. But the idea is just that for a passive house, um, there's, there's no combustion, right? So you get away from natural gas. So you don't worry about, you know, carbon monoxide. You don't worry about nitrous oxide and all the other things from an air quality perspective. You have super insulated walls that have thermal breaks. So you're not getting that the, the cold air or uh, the, the thermal transmittance between the wall um, is broken. Both um, windows are all triple pane windows. Um, your heating systems are very minimal, but they're very effective. Um, most of the time they're either radiant or um, some sort of heat pump. And so 
it's just the idea that if you build the house um, in a certain way, you require less energy. So like you were talking about with, like, there's a give and take, right? I can spend more money up front. What's that initial first cost? Um, passive house is more expensive. Um, but in the end, five, 10 years down the road, I'm saving money every single day because I'm not pissing it away on the drafts in my bedroom trying to keep my wife warm, right? And right. so, you know, Shane, you can speak to this quite a bit, I think, um, getting away from a first cost bias, right? How much, yes. did, how much does it cost me up front? Well, if that's the only number you look at and you forget that this thing that you're building is going to be sitting there for 50 or 100 years and you forget about those other 49 to 99 years, you're shortchanging not only yourself, your client, the community, the planet. I mean, it's, it's just the wrong thing. But I think people yeah. look at that and they say, well, I'm not going to be here for 50 years. The you buyer's know? not, the owner's not, but the builder, the builder. So, yeah, yeah. Is. And I, this is the, so I, I break it down for a builder as when, the, cause they have that same argument. Oh, what do I give it? I don't give two shits if that house stands for 50 years. Once I make my money and move on, I'm on to the next one. Who, who cares? You'll care because here's, here's the easy breakdown for them to understand. In the first year, you have to provide a homeowner, a uh, builder warranty, correct? Yep. On your systems, on your, on your, on your carpentry, on your labor, you know, all that stuff has to be warrantied for a duration, correct? Yep. How many callbacks on average do you get on each home that you built? You know, they give me a number. All right. Of those callbacks, how many are this, this, or this? You know, usually it's HVAC. You're going to have concrete callbacks, of, you know, at some level here because of the climate and, and people don't pay attention. But they go through and it's, it, usually it's a system problem. It's a, it's a mechanical problem. And it's an air conditioner. It's a, it's a furnace. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sheetrock issue, which has to do with a lot of thermal um, transfer that that's not being equated by the time the house is done, you know, depending on the season, whatever they have these callbacks. So they're spending money because they're pay either doing it themselves, which is rare, or the builders hiring his subs to come back and do the work. And if it's their fault, the subs fault, then the sub has to be out of pocket to fix it. If it's not the subs fault and the builders fault, well, the builders paying the sub. So you're spending money on a home that you just said you don't give a shit about once you collect your check as it, the alternative is putting some of these systems in that cost almost exactly the same amount of money and you're not going to get those callbacks, then start adding that number up. And now all of a sudden you do care because some of those systems have to be warranted for more than one year, right? You, you have bigger, you have a bigger or longer warranty. And it's, if they don't give two shits about their quality, they're going to give a shit about their, the money that's coming out of their pocket and the headaches they have to deal with. That's the biggest reason why builders walk out of the business it's because they can't deal with enough of the client headaches that come with construction and everything's going to fail if you don't do it right. Like if you, anything you do, right? So if you show them a number of the HVAC system costs this for an air conditioner and a furnace and the ducting, the whole thing costs $12,500, or you can do heat pumps that have no ducting at all and the cost is $12,500. Why do you default to the thing that you know instead of just going with this, the system that's better. It's because one, they don't know any different. And two, because it's, they see it as, well, if it's the cost of the same, it's gonna be faster for me to do it, but it's not because they're spending less money in the end, especially with systems and, and warranty issues. I know that's kind of long-winded, but that, that's, the, that's the definition of ignorance is, well, I don't know. And I'm not willing to figure it out. Like I'm not willing to someone to tell me the difference. So I'm just gonna say, that's just because I know that that's ignorance. Well, going, going back, going, going back to what James said earlier um, about the difference of home ownership mentality in the United States versus a lot of other places in the world, you know, home ownership in the United States for most people, I think the general assumption is home ownership is an investment. Correct. It's how you build wealth. There's gener generational wealth that can be built through real estate. That's how you get your bigger house that you can't technically afford. Right? You buy the right one. You make a smart decision. You sell that. You make a little money. You put a larger down payment down, get that house back down. And you can do this until you end up at your, you know, your white picket fence and your three quarters acre type thing. And it is a means to an end to the American dream. And I think, you know, from what you're just what you just said, Shane, in terms of a builder, you know, 
you got to kind of almost compartmentalize the conversation about money, value, and worth in terms of energy efficiency. And what are your energy consumption versus how you're getting your energy? And then thinking about now the investment component of it. Because if you're a builder and you're just building a development, I can see what you're saying. If you're someone who's custom building, like me hiring Shane to build a house, well, I'm the one paying for it, right? So the builder will just do what I tell him to build, right? Now, he, he or she may come in and say, well, I'm going to make an argument for not meeting minimum energy code, mm-hmm. right? Um, and maybe you can sell me on it, but ultimately, I'm the one paying for it. And so mm-hmm. the, the layman... Shane and I always talk about this, like it's the only industry I can think of where the dumbest person in the room is in control. You know, it's like, well, it's my money and uh, make it pretty. Like, I really want to talk about draft stopping with you. What? Um, And more money? Can I see it? Will my wife be able to touch it? No. Well, then fuck it. You know, (laughs) I think I think this is the part where. I'm listening to both of you guys talk and you're way more the expert when it comes to construction and home inspection than I am right on this. And I'm more so more of an expert than most people. Yeah. Right. So in terms of layman, I'm like right here, (laughs) you know, and you guys are like up here, right. I'm in a house right now that I bought a year ago and have been fixing up slowly. And this is just, I'm exact. I'm the quintessential example. This isn't where I want to live. This was an investment. I'm going to buy this because there was an opportunity to get into it at a relatively good price. It was in a neighborhood in which I could uh, accrue some equity. I could take that equity and it's like, I'm back from renting, right? Now I can, and I probably have over a hundred grand in this house. I'm going to finish it just to get it on the market and I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make more money, right? And so when I'm looking at that and I'm looking and this house needs some serious energy uh, evaluation. (laughs) There's literally like, you guys feel that? I don't even think we can keep our fire lit in here. There's so much draft, right? And I'm out there in my garage, like fuck, spray foaming, like, like, where? no, it's still coming. Where is it coming from the floor? This house has that problem. And when I think about how I could spend $15,000, for example, and thinking about what the house is for me and what it's supposed to be doing for me and what right or wrong, if I spend $15,000 on solar panels versus $15,000 getting the drafting to stop and warming up that room, the $15,000 in solar panels helps out what I'm doing more so than spending $15,000 on insulation and draft stopping and things of this sort. Um, Now, I don't know if those are equal. I'm just making a point that where I think the consumer has a long ways to go here because there's not the value associated necessarily until like the threshold hold for that value return in terms Mm -hmm. of an investment is so much higher on the energy consumption part. Like once you get to that German engineered R100, then all of a sudden the house is worth more money. But it's like, you got to get almost way up there before you see that value, right? Because if you just get to the energy star, I feel like someone's going to come in and say, okay, that's fine, but I need to redo the kitchen. And these are the comps in the neighborhood. And it's like, God, I didn't get the value for it. Well, and I think that, um, I mean, you bring up a couple of good points. You're absolutely right. And and there is, is, it's interesting because on one hand, we're saying a house is a commodity. It's just a Uh thing that I'm using to build equity and grow my asset, right? And then there's this other part of it that's like, my wife wants the pretty kitchen that is very emotional and personal. And And there's another spot, James, sorry, uh, where there's also a social responsibility and environmental responsibility of having the house, of energy consumption, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry. Right. And I think that, um, uh, well, so so what's happened in the home performance industry that's been interesting is for a very long time, we've talked about energy and how to save energy. It's called the International Energy Conservation Code, right? Um, But what we've realized is that that doesn't sell. Right? right, mostly because the cost to do it doesn't pay back. Energy costs are low. We 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 could argue about it being too low, right? Um, that's an easy thing for a white privileged upper class man to say, you know. But um, it should be more expensive because then people would be more responsible with it. That's a whole other conversation. But mm-hmm. um, 
but in, a, in the home performance industry, what we've realized is, um, <laughs> it's sorry, just, it just reminded me of the Chris Rock. You should just make, don't have the outlaw guns, just make the bullet 10,000 bucks. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, if you do that, it'll be a, a lot less. You're going to really invest that bullet. It won't be <laughs> wasted bullets anywhere. Sorry. Same idea. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I like it. But, you know, I think so. So where we've come is um, what we've realized. And and this is this is going to sound again like um, uh, I don't know, crass, I guess, but like health sells more than energy. Right. Um, when when you do something that improves the performance of a house, you, there are two main outcomes. You reduce your energy consumption. You also improve the health of the house, of the right. occupants that live in the house. Right. Because you improve the indoor air quality. And so there have been a lot of studies um, that um, both from a correlation point of view and a causal point of view, especially in kids, they have a causal connection between the quality of the air in a home and a child's proclivity for asthma, Mm. A, a, a direct correlation, right? So if the indoor air quality is bad, your kid is going to get asthma or be more prone to getting it. And so you say, well, from that perspective, if I go into a home, the same home, and I have two, I'm going to do the exact same thing to the home. But if I tell the homeowner, hey, you're going to save 20 bucks a month on your energy bill, and you got to spend 20 grand, they're going to say, take a hike, right? Yeah. If I say, spend this 20 grand, and your kid, you're not going to have to buy your kid an inhaler anymore, right? Your kid is going to sleep through the night, they're going to, they're not going to miss so many days of school. They're mm-hmm. going to feel better. They're going to be able to play more with their friends. Like, well, that's priceless. Right. Any amount of money. If my kid doesn't have to be on an inhaler and I don't have to get rid of my dog. Right. Um, and so we're, we've, we've spent the same amount of money. We've done the exact same thing to the house, but because the value proposition is different, one is going to get done and one isn't. And so while they're, there are some people that feel like that's kind of sneaky, but it really, it, it's all true, right? I'm not, but the, the challenge is as a builder to come in and say, I'm going to make your health better. You're just asking to get sued, right? <laughs> yep. This goes back to what we were talking about for whose responsibility is it to be putting this into the narrative when considering buying a home, selling a home or building one, right? Um, I don't think it's, I think it's a legitimate connection and I, I'm going back to what you brought up earlier. I've been thinking about it through this whole conversation about, you know, how to bring this forward and make this more of a conversation, make it more of a requirement, make it, you know, and it's like, like, okay, it's not though. It is in circles or it's a niche or niche, whatever, um, for people who are, are, you know, big environmentalists, somebody who is or but it's like what Shane you and I have talked about this before about how it's weird that electric cars aren't like widely adopted by the conservative group right it's like why is that like a left thing like you tree right. hugger and your leaf it's like wow, like that should be an economic conversation I mean, yeah, serving like bending. it should be almost the opposite of liberalism right. it should be exactly. the conservative every republican should be driving an electric car in yeah. my opinion, you know, it makes no sense to me. But somewhere there's this disconnect where it's like, how do you, if this is something you're trying to do, change the world one house at a time? And it's like, yeah, you can do it one house at a time, but that's so subjective, subjected to the house, the builder, or that person. And I think it's never really going to become, and it should be, this widely accepted, standardized thought that the home should function safely safely it should be efficient it should be uh g- getting its energy from a new renewable source but also not unnecessarily wasting energy um all of that and maybe this goes back to where we just blame the broker again you know <laughs> the real estate agent like who's not selling this who's not really going in and focusing on the 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 quality of the house how it how it gets its energy, how it uses it, how it performs in terms of the health, because this is where you're going to be. And if you go back again to the, like the historical context of shelter, like that was the whole point was to keep you safe, right. warm, um, healthy, out of the elements, uh, create a more 
uh, create longevity in your life and comfort um, and how you live in there. So you're not asthmatic or mm -hmm. um, allergies or whatever it might be. We do it with food, right? The government comes in and says, listen, you know, the Surgeon General's warnings and all of the um, health and drug or the FDA, we all say you can't have that anymore. We can't put that in food anymore. You got to package it this way. And there is a responsibility in terms of a government to come in and say, we got to overall protect the health. And when you think about health in terms of inside your home, what stress that puts on on taxpayers mm -hmm. um, to be able to have a house that's not safe uh, or not healthy and creating allergies and as, uh, asthma and other more serious things like radon and things like this where maybe I'm just trying to figure out, I'm just kind of thinking and spilling this out. I'm trying to figure out how you actually get there. Like, what do you well, actually cross? I think it's there? gotten better. I think it's, and, and to answer your, your first question of whose responsibility is it in theory, you know, in, in theory of society, the, the responsibility comes down to the person building the home. The builder should be responsible for building a quality product, right? If, you're, if that's your job, just like any, any industry, any business, your job is to, is to make something that's of quality on some level for a consumer, right? But we can't, can't expect that to happen in, in the real world. Like in theory, that sounds great. In reality, we're human beings. Um, there's plenty of people that either don't care or, or don't, aren't willing to care. And so we have to have laws and regulations to, con you know. On but that's on new well, homes. What percent no, no, of no, no, new exactly. homes are, it's are on every home ownership? Do you know? Percent like, of new homes is come to existing, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, eventually they're all become existing homes. Right. Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah. as, as far as, um, I mean, your, your housing stock is overwhelming. It's like 92% existing, right? I mean, it's. Yeah. And it, I mean, obviously, you know, state to state, it's going to change dramatically right now, especially, but. Well, you know, so it's interesting. I think that, um, so I, I have, I have, we'll, we'll go into future projections and then um, my, I've got to go soon, but um, there's, there's two, two things that I, 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 I have been interested. I want to follow. Right. So um, if you look, forward and say, where's the building industry progressing? You look at California and New York, right? And you say, California has a solar mandate now, 2020, they have, all of their houses have to have solar and they're all going to have to be net zero. And you say, holy cow, that's a, that's a really progressive goal. A lot of people say, ah, oh, it's just California being California, but they really do set the standard for where Montana will be in 50 years, probably who knows, but, mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's, if you want to look into the future, you say, well, what are those states doing? And so you could say, well, that's where the building industry is going to go. And I think that's true. Um, and I also think that it's true from a government perspective on how are we going to best help people? What you're going to see is a return of um, decreased code standards to help make houses more affordable. When we went through that, what was it like? 60s, 70s, and people needed to buy homes, and we were trying to like re-energize um, that American dream of everybody owning a home. Well, one of the ways we did that was HUD came in and said, I have a HUD building standard, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to use a two by four wall, you can use two by three. You don't have to have, you know, an R19 wall, you can have an R11 wall, right? Mm -hmm. And so by reducing the, the quality, um, you also reduce the cost and thereby made it more affordable for more people. So when you look across the country and you see um, this affordability crisis everywhere, well, what's the government gonna do? They're gonna say, well, we'll make it cheaper to build houses so more people can buy houses. Right. And that's gonna come into direct conflict with the progression that the construction industry has made and is continuing to make. And I think there's gonna be the, it's gonna be interesting to see where that falls. I think you're gonna see lower quality houses built in the next 10 years, honestly. But you're also, and, and then you're also going to see these really higher quality houses where like in Bozeman, for instance, we have tons of people from California and Seattle, you know, the, who have higher expectations and they come here and they're like, what are you doing? Right. right? And so, right. well, I say that about you guys out there just from the licensure standpoint, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there, I think there will be some, there, there, there will be this consumer driven push. I think that will, um, increase that quality of homes but and i think that the majority of the houses are still going to get built poorly because people are going to be more 
um, interested in how much it costs than they are with how it performs. And that's my pessimistic view, unfortunately. Well, and I agree with that, but I, I can tell you exactly why that is. We are having the wrong people make the decisions for how this should progress. Yeah. We're having politicians dictate to us how much a house should cost and how, how it should be built. Who should, be the, who should be the majority of people on the council that are writing these codes and dictating not only energy, but function? Should be right. yeah. people that are professionals in the industry, right? right? It's the same way we shouldn't be listening to politicians about science and, and how health works. It should be doctors. Yeah, a, a medical doctor right. is finally right. running the HUD. Yeah, like what the Yeah, heck? it doesn't make any sense. And that's, that's the biggest breakdown. I mean, Evan knows my stance on government in general, but the government's role is to be an advocate for the people not to rule the people, be an advocate for the people and take in what we're seeing and dealing with as everyday citizens and giving them information to then figure out how to put that together and help us in return. And then they, their job is basically to gather up and figure out how can we help financially and otherwise to make those things that they're asking for possible instead of just saying, well, we think we know better than you, so we're going to do it this way. And you end up with a more cheaply built, shittier home that doesn't help people out for the wrong reasons even though if their intention was we're trying to get more people homes they don't have the expertise to make that decision and write those regulations right. and that's what's happening i, I think, think we say, yeah I think that, you know when homes um there's also there's there's a there's a disconnect in in where the true value lies i think i mean i think a lot of a lot of contractors aren't willing to forego the 25 recessed lights, the pretty pendant lights and the granite countertop for more insulation and air sealing and a better HVAC system or an HRV, right? Like they say, we can't afford an HRV. I'm like, well, you could, if you didn't, you know, spend it on this other crap, you know, right. if you use, I don't know, you put a concrete countertop or quartz countertop that costs half as much, there's your 2,500 bucks, go put an HRV and make their health, their health better. Right. Um, so it's, it can be done. It should be done. I sure hope that it is. And I'll, I'm going to continue to be an advocate for that because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I, I think, and we can put a bow on this, but I think it's nicely laid out here in this conversation. I think there is an importance to building a home correctly and having it perform correctly. Um, and I don't think that's weighted fairly when you think about the consideration of the money or the investment or uh, the, just the consideration on purchasing a home. It's, it should be weighted heavier and it's not. Yeah. And I think there's a good argument to say, should that be a, a shift in thinking by the consumer and the builder, or should that be forced place by people looking after the overall economic and health of the citizens, which would be the uh, government. And I'm not sure what it is. And, and then what your idea of even a home is. Is it an investment or is it shelter where you grow and raise a family? You know, um, I don't know what it is. But listen, in the beginning, I thought I'm just going to take this uh, as I need to drain my water heater. <laughs> right. And now I feel like I'm going to obsess obsessively be thinking about this because it's uh, it's with 90, 92 percent of homes being already on market, right? Already built. You know, I just, for a guy like me, even thinking about finishing this house and what I need to do, it's like got me all jacked up. You know, I thought I would just put some solar panels on and put some more caulk down on some trim and, and leave. And now all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, it's like, what responsibility do I have to make this a better, safer and more efficient home? Um, and then how am I going to turn around? And when I put this on the market, sell that to somebody because it may not specifically be a return on my investment in the sale, but it'll be a return on my investment while I'm living here monthly. And maybe I don't get more for the house, but I ensure that I get the house sold more quickly. So it's quite an interesting conversation. I, I This has been great, man. I've really appreciated this conversation. I've enjoyed this, man. Uh, we don't want to yeah, take up wow. too much more of your time, but this has been great, dude. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, man. I, it's I'm glad we finally get you on here. I've been talking to you yeah. about it for yeah. a while. Well, this is good. And and let's just do, we'll do a teaser because um, I'm going to be building my own house this year. That's right. And, um, and it'll be interesting to see if I can put my money where my mouth is. Right? You should document <laughs> it. You should, so, you yeah, should do I some think, sort of documentation of it. We're going to do a little, um, a little docu-series where I'm yeah. going to 
you know, go along the path of really being on the other end of it and saying, all right, well, now we have this 20K, how are we choosing to spend this? And my wife and I have already had multiple arguments about like which stove (laughs) is going to be put in and how that's going to impact whether I get solar panels or not. That's right. (laughs) Have fun with that part. Have fun with that. And maybe we'll reach out to you because I'm getting ready to build a shipping container cabin Mm -hmm. that I would like to figure out how to do zero heat. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. Well, let's, um, let's keep in touch you guys. And um, Hey, these were Hey, what's up? <laughs> All right, we'll let you get back to it, man. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. This has been great. Um, to everyone out there listening, make sure if you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, do that whole thing, hit the notifications, et tell cetera, friends, support, yeah. tell your friends. Uh, James, try to get some people to listen. Up. I, you got so much to share, and I think you, you put it out in a way that's really consumable. You know, well, sometimes hey guys, we get people in here. You do to, yeah, man, for sure. Get out there. So. so how did everybody get a hold of you? Just give a shout out to your, your, your contact info, especially the people locally that are in Bozeman that can need to hire, need to hire James. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, the name of my company is Red Point. Um, it's a, it's a climbing reference to um, coming in with previous knowledge and climbing the route the first go. Um, so I come in first time with some knowledge and then do it right the first time. So yeah, um, I've got, you know, I've got a great website and uh, I don't do a whole lot on social. I should do more. And maybe that's one of my 2021 goals. Um, but uh, if they look up Red Point, they'll find me and I'm happy to help me like it. Very cool. Right on. Right on, man. Appreciate having you on for sure. Thanks, guys. Yeah. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon, buddy. Take care, guys. Happy holidays. Happy New right. Year. Bye-bye. Later. Later, Gators. You can see the world the way it really is. Always. Thank you.